This morning's reading is from Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, don't even go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you for these words from Mark. And as you inspired him to write them, so would you inspire us to hear what you would say to us this morning. Help us, Lord, to see Jesus. Amen. So, on the 1st of April, 1957 the BBC News programme Panorama showed this video. Huge numbers of viewers were taken in by that prank, even contacting the BBC where they might procure one of these spaghetti trees. And the response from the official uh, press release was to place a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best. In April 1934, American newspapers printed a photograph of a man flying through the air in a device powered by the breath from his lungs. Articles described how he blew into a box on his chest, which activated rotors that created a powerful suction force, sucking him into the air, and then skis on his feet served as landing gear with a tail fin allowing him to steer. It made its way to America thanks to a news agency that fell for the hoax and then distributed it to all their US subscribers. These hoaxes seem silly and childish and, and obvious to us today. Last week, the disciples got confused, if you were here. Um, they got confused about some bread. In fact, they got so obsessed over their lunch, they forgot to listen to the teaching. To those of you who listen to sermons every week, that might sound eerily familiar. When, how's your lunch doing? Is it in the oven? No? Yes, someone's, someone's lunch is in the oven. Last week, the reading ended in verse 21, with Jesus saying to his disciples, rather exasperatedly, do you still not understand? Mark leaves us with that question hanging, and actually with a bigger question, will they ever understand? Our reading today is a pivotal moment in Mark's gospel. His gospel is it's his book answering the question, who is Jesus? This is the turning point of the book. And in case you don't believe me, because I'm a nerd, I've prepared a couple of graphs for you that show the difference between Mark before this passage and Mark after this passage. Here's the first one. This is a graph showing all the miracles in Mark plotted against the chapter that they come in. So along the bottom, you've got chapters 1 to 16. The green line in the middle is this passage, and then the, the bar shows the number of miracles in each chapter. And the three little diamonds are what are called the healing summaries, where it says, and Jesus went around and healed lots of people. You can see that there are still some miracles on the right-hand side. One of those, by the way, in chapter 16, that's the resurrection. <laughs> so actually only four of those Jesus does himself but there are loads more before. And a similar thing happens with Jesus' teaching. It's not quite as dramatic. This is all the words from Mark's gospel between chapters 1 and 15, with Jesus' words colored in red. 
Now, I don't like Bibles that highlight the words of Jesus in red, because if you're doing that, really, the whole Bible should be in red. But uh, still, it's quite useful here. You can see on the left-hand side everything up to this passage, and on the right-hand side everything after it, up to chapter 15. Jesus has been teaching all along, but after this point, it increases. The vast majority of the second half of Mark is Jesus teaching. In the first half of Mark's gospel, Jesus' ministry expands out from Galilee to the whole of Israel and Judah, and then expands further, as we've seen in the last two weeks, to include Gentile, non-Jewish nations. In the second half of Mark's gospel, the circles start reducing more and more as he circles round Jerusalem. This is the moment that all of this changes. This is the pivot, the hinge in Mark's gospel. And it all hinges around this one question that Jesus asks, do you see? Now I know these screens are a little bit smaller than the old ones, but is that big enough? (laughs) Verse 22, if you've got a Bible, it'd be lovely to have a look at it with me. The reading begins in verse 22. Jesus and his disciples, they come to Bethsaida. So we're back in Israel now. And uh, Jesus there met a blind man. As we've seen, Jesus was famous for his teaching. So his friends, they begged Jesus to touch him. Wouldn't you? I mean, of course. So, uh, verse 23, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and he led him outside the village. There... He spat on the man's eyes, and then he asked, do you see? Now, I want to reassure you, it's a little bit gross, I want to reassure you that our prayer ministry team are not trained to spit on you if you come for prayer after a communion service. It's a bit gross. The interesting thing is it didn't work. Or rather, it didn't work completely. The man said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. (laughs) Anyway, Jesus tried again. This time without the spittle. Once more, verse 25, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and he saw clearly. What a relief. I was starting to worry that Jesus had lost his ability to heal. Had Jesus not had a good night's sleep? Was he tired? Was he distracted by you know, what he was having for his lunch? Perhaps he was hangry. I mean, that certainly stops me doing things properly. Or perhaps it wasn't a mistake at all. Perhaps Jesus was teaching us that a person can see without really being able to see. The first time, the man could see people, but they looked like trees. He could see, but he couldn't really see. We don't look like trees, do we? No, we do not look like trees. After Jesus' second attempt, Mark tells us three times to make sure we know it's important using three different phrases. He says, his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. So, he could see, he could see, he could see. Do you see? He could see! Okay, we get it. I hope you do. Why would Mark tell us this? Why does he tell us like this? The clue is in the verses either side of this miracle. So last week, as I said, we saw how the disciples, they really didn't understand what Jesus was on about. And the conversation ends in verse 21 with Jesus saying in his exasperated voice, do you still not understand? Then immediately after this miracle, in verse 27, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? Now, he's not some kind of Z-list celebrity yelling at an unimpressed cab driver. Don't you know who I am? For some time now, Jesus has been feeding and teaching the crowds. He's been healing the sick. He's been calming storms. And he wanted to know if anyone, anyone understood who he was. He wanted to know if anyone could see. His question isn't arrogant. Actually, it's sad. Because the disciples' answer was effectively no. 28. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. What did they mean? I mean, some people thought, like Herod Antipas in chapter 6, if you can remember a few weeks ago when someone preached on that. I assume they did. (laughs) He killed John the Baptist, and he thought that Jesus was John the Baptist come back to the dead. Except that it doesn't make sense because their ministries overlapped. 
I mean, I don't know if they were thinking of it as a bit like Clark Kent and Superman. They don't look alike, do they? Have you ever seen them in the same room? Well, actually, yes, in John chapter 1, they were in the same street. So not John the Baptist. What about Elijah? Well, the last prophet before this point, before John the Baptist, was Malachi. And uh, Malachi is, in the, is the last book of what we call the Old Testament. And uh, these are the last words of Malachi. Malachi 4, verse 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of their parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Those were the last words of the last prophet of Israel. Something like four or five hundred years before Jesus, those words have been ringing down the centuries. They were looking for Elijah to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So that's why they say, is he Elijah? No. Maybe they had this. There's a verse in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So they were like, well, if he's not John the Baptist and he's not Elijah, maybe he's this dude, whoever that is. A prophet like that, like Moses. See, what the people were doing, they were seeing Jesus and they were connecting him with a bigger story. The story of God and his people Israel down the centuries. They looked at Jesus and saw something, not something brand new, but something that had been unfolding for hundreds and thousands of years. The people's guesses were not right. Jesus was not John the Baptist. He was not Elijah. He was not one of the prophets. But neither were they entirely wrong. Jesus is part of of that bigger story. Sometimes Christians act as though the Bible begins on page 965. In the church Bibles, that's page 965. There's quite a lot of it before that. I I estimate 964 pages. How's my maths? Yep, thumbs up from the maths teacher. (laughs) The first verse of of the New Testament immediately points us back to the old. This is it, Matthew 1 verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now Abraham appears in chapter 12 of Genesis, which is somewhere about there. That's a long way back, almost right back to the beginning. The Old Testament points and leads us straight to Jesus. The people saw that. They just didn't quite get how. Jesus is the one longed for and promised by the prophets. He is, and this is the bit they didn't get, he is God himself coming to finish what he started. So we can't truly understand who Jesus is if we ignore all of that. And so, having spent a few months reading through the first eight chapters of Mark's Gospel, thinking about the question, who is Jesus, our next series, which starts in two weeks' time, is going to start right back at the beginning. And we're going to go through the Old Testament in 15 weeks. We'll see how it goes. And I pray that that will help us flesh out the picture of Jesus that we've got from Mark's gospel. And you should, I hope, see and recognize some of the things that have been pulled out of Mark's gospel way back in the Old Testament. More about that when we start in two weeks' time. For now, let's go back to Mark. As I said, the people weren't entirely wrong. They could see Jesus was special. That was obvious. So they assumed he had something to do with all those ancient prophecies. But they had no clue who he really was. They'd seen him perform miracles. They'd seen him feed thousands. They'd seen him teach with authority and cast out demons. They'd seen all that. But they couldn't really see. They were exactly like the blind man who said he could see people, but they were like trees moving around. It is possible to see Jesus without really seeing Jesus, without seeing who he really is. 
And that is why this series on Mark, we're now in week 21, is called, anyone remember? Who is Jesus? Well, that's gone well. <laughs> Mark wrote his gospel, his book, to answer that question. Why? Because he wants you to know. And that's why Jesus' question in the next verse is so important. This is verse 29. What about you, Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? I've told before the story of how I proposed to Jess, so I won't rehash it in full. For those of you who don't know it, it was outside her student house in Rachel Gardens over in Selly Oak. We were on the driveway, so romantic, no mountaintop. No, no, like, starlit sky. We were on the driveway. I pulled out the ring, went down on one knee and asked, will you marry me? Or something like that. That is a really important question. And she said yes, by the way. If you hadn't noticed. But this question is so much more important. First, it's a question that's for everyone, not just for one person, like me asking Jess to marry me. I love you all. I'm not going to ask you to marry me. It's not only for the disciples back then either. It's for everyone. And second, it has even bigger consequences. Getting married is a decision that should last a lifetime. Sadly, we know sometimes it doesn't. But the answer to this question has eternal consequences. What about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Like the reading did, we're going to end there with a couple of things I'd like you to do this week. The first, I'd love you to prepare for the service next Sunday. So next Sunday, we are having our Explore service, and it's the last service in this series looking at Mark's Gospel. And what I'd love you to do is think about your answer to that question, because next week, we're going to be sharing that with one another. So I'm giving all you introverts out there a whole week to think about it so when you come next week, you've got something to say. The second thing I'd like you to do this week is to pray. To see who Jesus is, we have to look. To be able to look, we have to be able to see. Yet each of us is born spiritually blind. It is possible to read all of Mark. In fact, it is possible to read the entire Bible and not get it. Many have. Like the blind man that Jesus met in Bethsaida that day, we all need a miracle. Not to see physically, although some of us do, but to see spiritually, which all of us do. So this week, I'd like you to pray. You might pray for a loved one a friend or family member that you know and love who doesn't yet know Jesus, pray for a miracle. Use that word. Pray God would open the eyes of the blind as he has in the past. Pray God would help them see and understand who Jesus is in a way that these disciples didn't yet. And pray for an opportunity for you to introduce them to Jesus. Or you might like to pray for yourself. Perhaps you don't know Jesus at all and would like to. Perhaps you realize you're like the blind man who could see people walking like trees, like the people who thought Jesus was one of the prophets. You aren't entirely wrong, but you don't really see who Jesus is. And this morning you realize you need a miracle to see who Jesus really is. Doesn't need complicated words. Simply a heartfelt request. Mark doesn't even tell us what the friends said of this man. Simply that they begged Jesus to heal him. You just need to say, please open my eyes. Help me see you and know you. Pray that prayer with all your heart and it will change your life. Do you see? Do you want to see? The question is, who do you say I am?
So as we reflect on those challenging questions, I was been thinking for a while about a very old song that's been redone. I suggest you listen to it by Lauren Daigle. And this is what it says. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I don't know about you, but I know that I often do the exact opposite. I take my eyes off Jesus. I stop looking at him. And instead of the things of earth, the things that bother me, the things that occupy my mind and keep me awake at night becoming strangely dim, they become bigger and bigger. And they start to obscure Jesus and blocked him out. And my prayer is that more and more I, and maybe this resonates with you, will turn my mind from the things of earth, from world events that are very distressing, to personal issues that are also distressing. And we'll see Jesus. But it's not just going to happen. The song says, turn. It requires action. Do I want to turn my eyes on Jesus? Do I want to look in his face? The song goes on to say, O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Saviour and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Or as sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors, we are. So I'll just say that first verse again as a prayer. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.